Hello. In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at the second of three major families of uh, theories of well-being. Uh, this one will be desire satisfaction. Um, just uh, apropos of nothing, uh, does it sort of look like the pattern that's uh, on the, the right-hand side of that image when you're not looking directly at it is sort of ever so slightly ooching toward the left and then you look back at it and it's not? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just my eyesight that looks a little funny, but yeah. The, this is just one of the standard clip art things that uh, PowerPoint suggested, but it's uh, all of a sudden weirded me out. Oh, I guess I'll keep it, though. I've recorded 30 seconds so far. Seem silly to ditch it all for that. Okay, well, let's um, keep in mind here that desire satisfaction is, again, one of three main stream theories of well-being. Uh, one, hedonism, we've already seen. Uh, desire satisfaction is the one we're going to take a look at here. Uh, and objective list views um, are, are the third major uh, view that we're going to close out uh, the unit taking a look at. So to define a desire satisfaction view, uh, this is very loosely uh, a family of views that say that well-being consists in satisfying desires. Really, really important uh, uh, concern here because it's really easy to get this confused with hedonism. Uh, so if the idea is that if you think that satisfying a desire is good because it feels good to satisfy the desire, that's not desire satisfaction, that's hedonism. Right. If the reason why satisfying a desire makes your life go better is because it adds pleasure to the life, then it's the pleasure that's important. And so uh, imagine, you know, having a desire and then having that desire satisfied, whether or not you get any pleasure from that desire, there's a sense in which you want to think that maybe it, it uh, you know, your life goes better as a result of that. So a, an easy paradigm case might be something like, um, uh, doing a, a hundred mile bike ride, right? This is a, you know, a desire I have. I certainly desire to do this. Uh, and there's a sense in which the, the, the process itself is not going to be enjoyable, right? There's going to be a, a lot of, you know, tiredness and soreness and pain and, you know, you got to sort of push through it. Right. Um, and so the, the experience itself is not pleasurable. Uh, certainly I might enjoy say, you know, I, I might enjoy remembering, you know, the accomplishment or describing the accomplishment. Uh, but the idea is that there's maybe an achievement that, that, that my life has gone better because I, you know, I, I satisfied this desire that I had, even if, um, uh, the, the process itself or even the outcome wasn't pleasurable. Uh, I'm sure you can think of other kinds of examples there where, where, where this notion of pleasure might come apart. In any case, it's not a problem to enjoy uh, satisfying a desire, but the desire satisfaction view is going to say that what actually makes your life go better is the fact that the desire was satisfied, not how you felt about the desire being satisfied. Right. I hope I'm, I've explained that uh, uh, clearly because it, it can be a, a, a sort of a slippery concept. And so one of the things I should mention, and I think, again, Schaefer Landau does a pretty good job of um, expressing this, is that it actually takes an awful lot of work to even get a desire satisfaction view off the ground. So you have to, in some sense, start with a really simple view and then refine it and revise it as you go based on the kinds of objections that you commonly see. In fact, that's exactly how we're going to look at it. Uh, and, and this will follow the text rather closely, although uh, a lot of the examples will be novel and, and uh, I hope illustrative. So the first version of the desire satisfaction view we're going to take a look at is version A. Uh, which is that desire satisfaction is necessary for well-being. That is, that a life cannot go well, um, you know, un, un, unless you know uh, the desires in it, like all the desires in it, are satisfied, right? Um, and so. There are some 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 counterexamples, right, that are mentioned uh, in the text. Again, I wanted to try and, and, and flesh some of those out. So one counterexample to view A, right, that desire satisfaction is necessary for well-being, is this notion of uh, pleasant surprises. Okay, so this seems like something that might improve your well-being, as it, like when you get a pleasant surprise, it seems like that makes your life go a little better. But notice that. The thing about a pleasant surprise is that, that the reason it's a surprise is because you didn't desire it, you didn't look for it, right? And so, you know, imagine that uh, you, you know, uh, um, you know, 
somebody just you know pays for your meal in front of you at the drive through like you didn't desire that somebody would pay for your meal it just sort of happens you're like oh well that's very you know how how nice of them and maybe it's like been a really hard week for you financially and and so you know every little bit helps and you know it's 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 just a real great thing at the time and it, it actually really helps you out and you know makes your life go a little bit better um but it's not like it didn't satisfy any desire and so it, it the desire satisfaction theorist is going to have a really really hard time at least if they're type A desire satisfaction theorists are going to have a hard time saying how pleasant surprises improve your life because of course you didn't they didn't satisfy any desires even though they did something that was ostensibly good for you right also um uh, consider the case of of like the desires that uh, you know like say small children have right you know so i've got this photo here of um you know luckily this child is, is just on a on a little bit of a rock near the grass but i mean you've probably heard stories about somebody who's like oh yeah i took you know a pair of wings up to the top of the barn and you know my older brother hadn't stopped me well i would have been the end of it right you know because the idea is that you know they have these desires right uh, but it seems like actually satisfying that desire would not would not bring about any well-being and so you get some of those kinds of counter examples um and also uh you know suicide prevention is is a real thing like when, when people are suicidal um uh, people who care about them rightfully uh try and stop them or try and dissuade them and try and say look even even though you you desire right now you really do desire to end your life it's not that's that wouldn't be good for you right and and of course many people who get through such difficult times uh come to realize later right that uh, uh that that desire satisfying that desire would not have actually made anything any better um and uh and and they hopefully right become you know sort of grateful that, that they didn't uh, they didn't do it uh and so uh i mean that's these are very real kinds of examples, uh, but they're things that the desire satisfaction theorist has a really, really hard time with. If you're, if they're going to be a very basic desire satisfaction theorist, like of type A, that just says like, look, all that has to happen to to enhance your well-being is to satisfy some desire. And again, it seems like some of the counterexamples are really straightforward there. So this isn't a, it's not a very good view. So we have to modify it. So. One way you can modify it is to say that okay, does desire satisfaction is then sort of sufficient uh, for for well-being? That you know, if you you know, as as long as um, you know you've you've got you know this. As long as you have this desire and get it satisfied, you know, then then that's that's all that really matters, right? You know, even if. Um, nothing good happens as a result of it or you know even something bad happens as a result of it just the satisfaction itself was sufficient to increase well-being and and of course there are many counterexamples to this as well um and the the best of these being desires that are, are that are based on false beliefs right so uh, i've just put a sampling of various things below there let's focus on the one on the right there um where you know if you've ever seen like a fast food a a advertisement or like a menu picture or something uh <laughs> you know like oh that yeah that looks really good i want that right and then of course the, that, that's not actually what you want right uh, you know uh, what you want is energy you don't actually just want whatever this this i mean this energy drink will will you know use stimulants to raise your blood pressure which might make it harder to go to sleep but I mean, that's not the same thing as having more energy so again it's one of these things where you might think you want one of these things that's you, you don't really want them um and uh, etc so whenever your desires are based on like false beliefs right then you know the idea is that uh, satisfying the desire doesn't seem like it's it it doesn't seem like that's sufficient for improving your well-being right just because you you know sort of got a thing that you thought you wanted doesn't necessarily mean that it really did you any good and so again version b that desire satisfaction is sufficient for well-being is also not a great view um, and uh, it would require you to accept a lot of really counterintuitive things and so desire satisfaction theorists generally refine the view a little bit further say let's call it version C of desire satisfaction. This is where the, it's the satisfaction of informed desires that's sufficient for well-being, right? So this gets we, gets us out of some of these like, you know, uh, uh, beliefs that are or desires that are based on ignorance of one kind or another. Um, but yet we run into different kinds of counterexamples with this sort of view. So again, let's, let's get clear here. This view says that as long as, you know, your desires aren't based on some kind of false belief, then if they get satisfied, then, then that's what makes a life better. So compare two lives, one of them has these, has a bunch of their informed desires satisfied, and another one doesn't have as many of their informed desires satisfied. Well, the one that has more of their informed desires satisfied is the better one, right? That's, and again, that doesn't sound ridiculous, um, but again, there are some, some, counterexamples uh, so some of the counterexamples include desires that do not affect our interests uh, and and various kinds of other regarding desires and so I've, here's an ex you're seeing uh, if you're uh, in the lower left corner um, 
there's a picture of a celebration of a baseball team uh, who won. It's actually the, it's the World Series before the last one. Um, uh, but that's, you know, um, it's my favorite baseball team. And uh, it was great. I was very happy that my baseball team won the World Series. I desired that they win the World Series. Um, and that desire wasn't based on any kind of like ignorance or anything. It was a fully informed desire. Uh, but it's hard to it's hard to really flesh out exactly how my life got any better because my favorite baseball team won the World Series. Because um, that desire doesn't actually affect my, my my life in every material way would be no different if they had or hadn't won the World Series. I mean, I you know, um, you know, all of the all my whole life between 1995 and uh, you know 2021. Um, they did not win the World Series, and again, my again, had they won eight times instead of none, I, again, I don't know that my life would really have been any different, despite that I desire them to win the World Series every year. Um, and so it's one of these things where you know, again, you you might you might object, you might say, oh yes, but doesn't didn't that feel good to see them win? Was, of course it did. But again, if it's the pleasure that makes the satisfaction of the desire uh, and uh, contribute to your well-being, well then that's just hedonism, right? That's not the desire satisfaction view. We want to we want to think that if that there's some reason for thinking that th that the satisfaction of the desire itself actually made my life better in some way. And it's really hard to do that uh, with these sorts of things, right? So you're like, boy, I hope so-and-so wins the, a Grammy this year, right? You know, or <laughs> I hope so-and-so slips and falls on their butt because they were a jerk to me, right? And it's like, so some of those things happen. Does that, again, does that really make your life better aside from perhaps experiencing some pleasure at the event? Right. And again, it's really hard to, to come up with how, how that is. And so, again, uh, desire satisfaction theorists tend to revise view C right into into a different view. Uh, uh, actually, before getting to view D, I should I should mention that it's at this point that uh, in the literature, a lot of these uh, views are called ideal advisor views. So a really common kind of desire satisfaction theory. Uh, proposes something like C, but it's it's a, it's a little fleshes it out a little more. Um, what they say is that um, your well-being is enhanced, that is, your life gets better for you uh, by satisfying desires that a maximally informed version of yourself would have. So if you picture you, except with all of the possible information you could have, right, then then that's then whatever that ideal advisor would desire any fulfillment of those things actually makes your life better all right it's, it's a very interesting kind of a, a view it's a nice sort of a twist um i myself i i, I don't think it works i don't think it really saves uh, a desire, the desire satisfaction view from some of its most clear counter examples but um but it's, it's a very interesting and a fairly common uh, move that's made by a lot of desire uh, theorists and so there's one one counter example that is uh, I, I i i will say this isn't this isn't my own counter example this is one that's in the literature and i read it long enough ago i don't remember uh and i was not able to sort of track down where this example came from from. Uh, but whoever whoever came up with the example, you know who you are. If you happen to ever view this video for any bizarre reason, please leave it in the comments. Um, or of course, anyone who happens to know where this came from. Great. Anyway, the the, the kind of example is something like this. So imagine um, imagine that the ideally informed version of yourself can really tell the difference between really good fine wine and like the cheap stuff. And so they desire that you buy only the fine wine, which of course you know tends to be much more expensive, you know, than than the cheap stuff. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, does your life go better for you if you only buy the fine wine, even though you can't actually tell the difference, but only your ideal informed counterpart could tell the difference? Uh, it's I, I you don't know. It doesn't seem like it. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's another another really interesting counterexample. And just by the way, uh, in this image I I had generated by an AI image generator because I couldn't quite find what I was looking for. What I really wanted it to do was was generate a bottle of wine that says 100 years old on the label, just because it's kind of like a stupid joke, right? You know, so someone's like, oh, this wine's so good. It look, it says it's 100 years old on the label, right? Um, and if you don't quite get why that's a joke, think about it for a minute, right? And then and then you know, it's not a super funny joke, but you know. There you go. Uh, but again, but it doesn't actually do text. So it just gives you a sort of texty looking type stuff. And I'm like, oh, I guess that makes sense. It's not actually thinking. It's just sort of like, you know, sort of statistically picking things out. So, I mean, whatever. It's not that important. The example is the example. 
All right, so let's try again. Let's say, all right, let's 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 do version D, okay, of, of desire satisfaction. Um, so this says that satisfaction of our informed self-regarding desires is sufficient for well-being, right? So all of your desires that don't really have anything to do with you or your, you know, you know, situation, none of those actually uh, enhance your well-being if they're satisfied. Okay, we're just going to draw a line in the sand there and say, ah, all right, fine. Okay, and so they have to be informed. That is, they can't be based on any false beliefs, and uh, they have to be self-regarding. And then those are the desires that, if they are satisfied, makes your life go better for you. Right. Well, and it, but, but again, there's counterexamples, and the counterexample in this case is disappointment, which is familiar, right? I think we've all been disappointed with things, even in a very, you know, sort of pedestrian way. Uh, I'm sure all of you have, uh, you know, wanted to see a movie and looked forward to seeing it, desired to see the movie, and then you end up seeing the movie and it sucked, right? So you were disappointed, right? So so does your life get is, is your life better for having seen a bad movie? Well, it's hard to think of how it is. <laughs> In fact, it'd be better if you hadn't actually wasted your time on the bad movie, despite the fact that you wanted to see it. Um, and so, you know, there's that. Right? So other cases of disappointment can range to, you know, the much more sort of, uh, uh, you know, much more lifelong instead of, of you know, sort of temporary. Uh, and and in this case, uh, I, here's something that, uh, that Harrison Ford once said, if you don't recognize that, that's the photo. Um you know, uh, he says, you know, there's nothing good about being famous. Uh, you always think if I'm successful, then I'll have opportunities. You never figure that the cost of fame will be a total loss of privacy. That's incalculable. What a burden that is for anybody. It was unanticipated and I've never enjoyed it. You can get the table you want in a restaurant. It gets you doctor appointments, but what's that worth? Nothing. Okay. And you, know, you might say, oh yeah, there's, there's a word complaining about his life, but you know, it's a legit complaint, I think. Um, you know, just because you want to do something, uh, like, you know, just because the work you want to do will end up being appreciated by many, many people doesn't necessarily mean that you want the way you want people to react the way they do in the sense that there's this sort of, as he says, total loss of privacy, et cetera. I think, I think it's a legitimate grief. Um, but imagine that, that he, he legitimately desired, like he had a very informed desire for fame, right? He says, I want to do, you know, sort of, I want to be famous. I want to, you know, and then, you know, when he became famous, he discovered what it was really like. And he was like, oh, this is terrible, right? This hasn't made my life better. It's made it worse, right? Um, well, that seems to be, a, 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 again, a, a problem, a real counterexample to this idea of satisfaction of informed self-regarding desires actually making our life go better for us. So you've guessed it. There's another one. So you're like, is there an E? How many of these are there, right? It's like, well, you should have probably read the book. You know you know how many of them there are. Uh, so uh, let's let's go to E, right? This is the this this is the view that the satisfaction of informed self-regarding desires that bring pleasure is sufficient for well-being. And I think by the time you've gotten here, um, I think the desire satisfaction theorist has maybe lost the plot a little. In the sense that, uh, you. By the time that you've started to say, oh well, you have to have these 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 the the the, res, the pleasurable result is sort of necessary in 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 this you know to to make the the satisfaction of the desire good. Uh, essentially, you're 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 just squeezing into hedonism and right? saying that that's really why it's good to satisfy the desires because it feels good to satisfy the desire, not because there's something intrinsic about desire satisfaction that actually makes a life go better for you. Um, and so. I, I think that the best versions of the desire satisfaction view uh, are a little bit further down the list and just kind of bite the bullet on some of those um, uh, counterexamples and, and, and sort of, you know, argue through them um, and, uh, you know, just accept this. I will look, that might be counterintuitive, but that doesn't mean, it, you know, it's the wrong view, right? They want to say that, that, that what it does explain maybe can outweigh some of the things that it has trouble with. Uh, that's, that's, that's my own view, um, but, uh, you know, it's a, a fairly informed view. So, some counterexamples to to this, aside from from you know the, these worries about this just being the same thing as hedonism or hedonism with a little bit of window dressing, uh, is that there are some real counterexamples here too, and so one of these is something like unaware um, desire satisfaction. Um, so uh, you know the idea is is can something satisfy a desire without you being aware that it did, you know? So like um, you know say that uh, it would you know give me a great deal of pleasure if um, the number of stars in the universe were a prime number, right? Um, well, okay, maybe, maybe. so, so if, I, if I just desired that the number of stars in the, in the universe be prime, um, 
and that would give me great pleasure. It, it seems like I would never actually get the pleasure, but you want to say, well, look, if, if, if the number of stars really is prime, then that desire has been satisfied. And since satisfying that desire would bring pleasure if you knew, well, then then that, you know, that makes your life go better for you. And that, that, that's a, it's weird. Uh, better better counterexamples are even the idea of impoverished or even oddball desires. So let's talk about impoverished desires for, for the first thing. And that'll finally explain what I hope hasn't been too awfully distracting, which are the sort of dancing, this dancing avocado gif. It was the goofiest avocado gif I saw on a, on a page. And so I'm like, yeah, that's the one. Uh, anyway, the, the story has to do with an avocado, but not in any, you know, real serious way. So the, the I, I, Recall uh, listening to a podcast. I don't even remember which one now. The story was of uh, you know a kid who whose mother was a little eccentric, you know, and uh, had uh, you know gotten really dissatisfied with life the way it was, and and so ended up just taking this 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 guy, her son, uh, you know, when he was a little kid, just up into the woods. And they they squatted in the woods. They just like literally lived in the forest for you know most of his childhood, and kind of lived off of the land. And you know, it was, it was a very meager existence. You know, they had just like ramshackle shelters because you know that that they just sort of just cobble it together with what what they had and you know and when you're a kid everything's normal so like you just didn't realize what was going on that that was that was not that was not the typical way uh you know to to live in a modern society and um you know it, at one point he said he was when he was about like eight or nine or something he started you know to they started to go into town more you know and like one time you know he he you know got an, an avocado right which is you know sort of a total luxury for you know for them and and he ate it and he was like it was so good it's like i i promised myself like what i wanted out of my life when i grew up was just to be rich enough to have an avocado every day Right. I mean, like an avocado costs, what, 50 cents a dollar, something like that. And so it, you don't have to be particularly rich to have an avocado every day. But but if that's all you can imagine, right, uh, then then the idea is that, OK, so so somebody has these desires satisfied, but those desires are so meager and so like, you know, so tiny because that's all they can imagine. Does satisfying those desires really is that really does that really make their life a good one right as good as somebody who satisfied much more you know sort of core desires or something like that and then um yeah it's it's a it's a very again an interesting question a difficult problem that desire satisfaction theorists have to deal with um, and then finally of course there's oddball desires uh where which i think are the the strongest counter example to most desire satisfaction theories because the idea is that just imagine somebody wanted to you know count the blades of grass in their yard or you know say putty until they died um if they actually do those things, does that make their life better for them? Uh, it's hard to see how, right? Other than just that they get this desire satisfied, and so I don't know. It's it's a it's counterintuitive, and it, it's a it's a trouble. And again, desire satisfaction theorists, for the most part, will either just bite the bullet and say yes, you know, like what do you want from me? Like you know, sometimes people do have oddball desires, and and that's that's up to them. And if they get those desires satisfied, their life really is better for them. Um, and if you find that deeply counterintuitive, well, you're probably not a desire satisfaction theorist, and that's probably why. So one other criticism of desire satisfaction views uh, in general, be they uh, version A through version E, uh, is that it they, that they may reverse kind of what depends on what, right? And there's a, a fairly old criticism uh, of, of desire satisfaction views. Um, and this is, I brought in, uh, again, uh, just a quote from Roger Crisp from the SEP entry uh, on uh, well-being, because, again, he put it so well, I thought, well, may as well just quote it and throw it in there. Uh, so so he says this. He says, the idea that desire satisfaction is a good-making property is somewhat odd. Uh, as Aristotle says in, in The Metaphysics, that's a collection of Aristotle's writings translated by David Ross, uh, who you'll see uh, later in the course, actually, in a different capacity. Uh the quote is, desire is consequent on opinion rather than opinion on desire. In other words, we desire things such as writing a great novel because we think of those things as independently good. We do not think that they are good because they will satisfy our desire for them. And so there, that may be something that's, again, that's a criticism, that may be something that desire satisfaction theory just gets backwards. Uh, the reason we desire something is because it's good. We, it's not good because we desire it. Um, and that seems to be, um, you know, maybe a, a confusion. Again, perhaps the truth is the other way around. And it's, you know, uh, it's Aristotle and Roger Crisp and, 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 you know, a lot of other people that are mistaken. That's possible. But 
The last thing I wanted to bring up is uh, the number of views, both ancient and modern, uh, that seem to argue against not they don't just argue that desire satisfaction is not the right view of well-being, but in fact, uh, affirmatively argue the opposite. In some sense, they argue that desire elimination is actually a, a, a good path to well-being. And, uh, you know, I mean, this isn't going to be a thoroughgoing exploration of all of these philosophies, but I did want to at least mention that there are some of these views that uh, seem to to very strongly uh, sort of a, a disagree with desire satisfaction views. Uh, so uh, one of them just goes back to uh, uh, the great sage uh, George Carlin, who had, you know, one of his routines had said, you know, you ever hear people complain, my needs aren't being met, right? His response, drop some of your needs. Um, so again, think of this as practical advice. And like, I'm sure you know somebody right, who might complain so much about all the stuff that they, you know, that they, they want that they don't have. It's like, you know, maybe you just shouldn't want so much, you know, maybe, maybe your, your desires are, are, are part of the problem here. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that actually might really be practical wisdom that you might recognize. Um, in fact, again, it goes way back, right? There are plenty of ancient views that are like this. Um, the, uh, uh, the second of the four noble truths of Buddhism is that desire is the cause of suffering, right? Is that, is that it's uh, it's being you know so attached to wanting so many things that causes so much suffering in life, and I mean it would be oversimplifying it to say that like all desire is bad. That's not really what they say. So of course, uh, of course you're supposed to desire enlightenment and all that sort of stuff. That's fine, right? But but the idea is that you should really you know, reduce your attachment to so many things, right? You have, you know, like uh, just sort of, you know, back off and like in some sense, drop some of your needs, right? So so that way you don't suffer from not having them met, right? And there are plenty of things that, that aren't really all that important, that aren't as important as enlightenment and virtue and that sort of thing, et cetera. So I mean, that's that's kind of the idea. And and uh, Buddhism is not the only ancient view that, that has that, um, that kind of a, an element to it. Um, uh, that kind of an element is also present in uh, ancient Greek schools of thought like Stoicism. Stoicism is one of these views that says, um, seeing something of a resurgence lately that, you know, says that what you want to do is, again, um, reduce how much your well-being depends on things that are outside of yourself, right? That is, you know, the, the, you know, the satisfying your your wants or wanting the world to be a certain way or to give you certain things. Um, instead, you know, you'd be just be you know sort of calmer and 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 more detached, right? Again, it's kind of desire elimination rather than desire satisfaction in a very real sense. And modern movements like uh, voluntary simplicity sort of uh, are you know sort of bringing that back. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of voluntary simplicity, but there's you know this is this is one example. Of this book here, uh, probably one of the more popular uh, sort of. Ec uh, books that explain the the voluntary simplicity movement but yeah you see people say yeah you just you don't need so much stuff you don't need uh, to have you know all of these you know conveniences and and uh, you know uh, it doesn't really make your life any better you know and so you instead you know focus on things like you know you know like meditating clearly having good personal relationships you know uh, it's it's a very much a, a less is more kind of philosophy of life and the fact that some of these philosophy of life really do seem plausible to many um, again, seems to be a real problem uh, for the desire satisfaction view. And of course, uh, the desire satisfaction theorist does likely have at least some pretty good replies, uh, some of which are in your text and others of which uh, uh, would, you know, may not be, but are, are, are certainly uh, present uh, in the literature, which you can uh, I'd recommend you take a look at if you're very interested in this particular theory of well-being.